69th episode of the Ultimate Health Podcast. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here to take your health to the next level. Today, we're interviewing alternative farmer Joel Salatin from Polyface Farms, and this gentleman is so passionate about his animals. Yeah, he's super inspiring, and you guys are going to love our conversation. So before we get into details on him, I want to mention about a couple of amazing gifts that I got this week. It was my birthday on November 11th, and Jesse got me a Fitbit. And I also got it's something called Inner Balance, and it's a heart math monitor. But the Fitbit I got to test out today, and I don't know how many of you guys have a Fitbit, but uh, I'm pretty excited to see the details on it. It tracks so many things day in, day out. So I'm excited to monitor myself. Yeah, you can track your steps, your sleep. And yeah, these are a couple of really tacky gifts. And Marnie, um, let's just say she sometimes needs a little bit of assistance when it comes to the technological stuff. So it'll be interesting to see how uh, she responds to these. But two health-oriented gifts that uh, I'm sure Marnie's going to get a lot out of. Well, this is what happens in the health world, what you uh, what you get for people. So yeah, a Fitbit to keep my health on track and my fitness on track, which I'd say I'm pretty good at it, but this is a great way to keep myself accountable. So maybe for you guys, this might inspire you to look into it a little bit further. I can't comment too much on it because I've just had one and a half days wearing it, but it's the heart math one that I'm also excited about. So I don't know, JC maybe wants me to relax a little bit more, but uh, <laughs> I'm excited about that one. Yeah, that one, again, we're learning about it, but it's supposed to help you get into that parasympathetic state and relax. And it's it's got an app for her iPhone. And yeah, we'll get back and give you guys some more details on both of these as we get to play with them. And we're excited. Very excited. So I'm going to give a little shout out to Sun Warrior, our show sponsor and Canadian listeners. I have good news for you. Sun Warrior Classic Plus is available in Canada through raw elements. And we're just, I'm just so excited for you guys to try this. It's got brown rice, pea, quinoa, chia seed, and amaranth. And it's delicious. Vanilla is my favorite. Maybe you like the chocolate or the natural, but I'd say give vanilla a try. That's my fave. And Jesse's going to tell you how to get some. Yeah, this protein has become our favorite and you guys are going to love it. Very exciting. You can now get your hands on it here in Canada. And all you have to do as a listener of our show is type into your web browser, ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. And all the information there is really easy to follow. Get your discount. If you order $100 or more, you get free shipping. So obviously, that's the best way to go. Get a really great deal on your Sun Warrior health products, and you're going to love them. So now back to Joel. Joel's an alternative livestock farmer from Virginia. He's featured in New York Times bestselling book, Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. He was in a couple of documentaries you guys may have seen. If not, you should. Food Inc. and Fresh. He's the author of nine books. He's a sought-after speaker. And what he does, he uses modern technology to try and mimic the natural environment for his livestock. And he puts them first. So it's a really cool way of farming and we're going to get into all the details on the show yeah he's super passionate about his animals and we talk about food security and accessibility to good quality food he's got three tips to help anyone access good food and and i love this we talk about the difference in nutrients in grass-fed versus grain-fed cows and we also ask him, why don't all farmers farm this way? If it's so much healthier for the farmer, healthier for the animals, the food and product is a lot healthier and it's healthier for the planet. So it's really interesting to see what his perspective is on why this is the minority when it comes to farming. If you guys haven't done so already, be sure to join our group on Facebook Marnie and I get in there. We answer your questions. It's just a great community for all of us to share information, answer each other's questions. And before we do interviews, periodically we go into the group and post and ask you guys if you have any questions for that guest. So really interactive. We're having a lot of fun over there. All you guys need to do to get in the group is go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash community join up. It's free. It's a closed group. We can just have great conversation there and we'll see you on Facebook. So now it's time to get into the show with Joel Salatin. 
Hello, Joel, and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I hope you all are. Yeah, we're excited to have you on the show. This is really, really exciting. I've been uh, tracking you for a while, and I'm just so happy to have a conversation with you. Great. Well, let's jump right into things here, Joel. Uh, You're an alternative farmer, and your practices are quite different from the conventional farming methods we see today. Let's open things up and just compare and contrast some of the differences between what you're doing and what a conventional farmer is doing day to day. Sure. Well, you know, some of these are uh, are pretty, they they sound so elementary that it's funny to say them, but uh, but, but we differ on pretty fundamental levels. Uh, first of all, our animals move. <laughs> you know, the uh, uh, the conventional folks right now today, they, they don't think animals are supposed to move. And uh, um, that's a pretty fundamental difference. Animals move. We are carbon-centric as opposed to petroleum-centric. Uh, I realize you could argue that petroleum is a sort is a type of carbon, but but the point is that that um, that we run our our fertility and our soil building our, our whole fertility program on on real time carbon. You know, wood chips, uh, uh, hay, straw, leaves, things like that. So our our, our uh, fertility program is carbon centric as opposed to you know chemical fertilizer centric. Uh, we are we are trying to create a terrain that boosts the immune system. So rather than looking at a sick animal and saying, "Oh, I guess that animal is uh, pharmaceutically disadvantaged," uh, when we have a sick animal, we say, "Well, what did we do to break down the immunological terrain that allowed the animal to get sick?" You know, at its foundational level, our view is that nature is fundamentally well. And the conventional right now, the orthodoxy of our day is that nature is fundamentally sick and we need a bunch of, um, you know, artificials to make it well. And we believe nature is fundamentally well. And if it's sick, we probably made it sick. Uh, we are multi-speciated as opposed to monospeciated. Uh, most farms only have one plant or one animal. They're, they're extremely uh, specialized and simplistic in that approach, whereas we're multi-speciated, so lots of different species of plants, lots of different species of animals, all in a uh, in a choreography of synergy and symbiosis, as opposed to you know just a single a single thing. We're people centric. If you come to our farm and honk the horn at one o'clock, uh, there might be you know ten or fifteen people come pouring out of different places and come to greet you. Uh, the average farm in America, if you go at one o'clock, honk your horn, nobody's home because they're all in town working their town job to, to support their farm addiction on the weekend. And we think that farms should actually be places where there are a lot of people. So we have strategically, we have strategically exchanged machinery, capital intensive infrastructure, energy intensive infrastructure, and pharmaceuticals and chemicals for observational expertise. And that's a strategic decision and we don't apologize that this puts more people on farms but it the people that come to the farm more eyes more eyes per pound of food we think is a is the way to bring accountability into the system we're fundamentally integrated as opposed to segregated so uh we like uh, local food systems we like direct marketing to our neighbors we like the food security and accountability and integrity that comes when there's a short chain of custody between you know farmer and eater. And finally, I would just say that on our farm, we increase the commons. We don't hear much talk in, you know, regular circles today about the commons, but the, the commons is air, soil, water, wildlife, carbon. That's all part of the commons. It, you know, you don't really own it. It passes through. It's, we didn't put it here and, and it'll be here after we're gone. And so uh, what we want to do in our farming is to actually increase the commons rather than decrease the commons. And that means we want, at the end of the day, we want more water, more wildlife, more soil, more oxygen, more carbon uh, sequestered. You know, those are all aspects of the commons. So when you, you know, when you add all those up, uh, there's some pretty pretty fundamental differences there. Yeah, and you know what? It's pretty amazing to see your farm in action. My favorite movie was Fresh. That was my first introduction to you, and 
I absolutely love that movie. And I loved seeing how you do what you do. And I love your reference as well to, you know, bringing out the expressions of all the animals, the chickenness of the chicken and the pigness of the pig. So I'd love for you to express that a little bit more and how important that is for animals to fully express themselves and how different this is, just to expand on what you were saying earlier, on the common conventional factory farming that's happening these days. That's uh, pretty scary. Sure. Well, the worldview of our orthodox or conventional farming system today, I mean, the, the, the Western world is basically that, uh, that life is fundamentally mechanical, that life is no different in substance than, you know, a copper widget, a plastic doll, a piece of wood, that it's fundamentally mechanical or protoplasmic structure. Our view is that life is fundamentally biological that there's a big difference between biological systems and mechanical systems. Mechanical systems are not spontaneous. You know, when you turn the key to your car, it doesn't uh, kick the tires off. When you turn the key to an ox, it might kick your tires off. The point is that there's no sentience to mechanical things. Mechanical things can't heal. You know, if you abuse your car, don't put oil in the engine, you can apologize, you can ask its forgiveness, you can weep, anoint it with healing salts and whatever, and it won't get any better. But life, biological things, do heal, whether it's emotional healing through forgiveness, whether it's remedial healing action through healing procedures, nurturing. The fact is that biological systems do heal. And so there are really, really fundamental differences between living things and inanimate things or mechanical things. And so we view our plants and animals, we view life from a fundamentally biological lens, which requires that we appreciate its sentient, responding nature to what's around it. It it responds to impulse. It responds to stimuli. And I think it's fascinating that we know there are far more nerve strands going into our intestines, for example, in our bodies and go into our brain. So when when we talk about, you know, I feel sick to my stomach, that can be psychological, it can be physical, it can be mental, it can be spiritual. The truth is that when our gut is sick, it affects how we think, it affects everything about us. And so that's the kind of spontaneous responding that we see in life around us. So when we look at a chicken, we don't just look at something that we have the freedom to manipulate however cleverly hubris can imagine to manipulate it, to grow it faster, fatter, bigger, cheaper, uh, as if it's just an airplane or an object that we're making. Rather, the chicken has value, has sacredness in and of itself, a glory in and of itself a distinctiveness. And so we do dare to ask the question, does it matter if a chicken can express its chickenness, a pig its bigness, a tomato its tomatoness? Because it's in that expression, A, that we honor, that we honor the life before us, that then in turn creates the sacredness of the life that's given in eating that something else may live. If we view it as just a mechanical thing that we can manipulate however cleverly hubris can imagine to manipulate it, then there's no innate sacredness to it. There's no reverence there. There's no honor. And so it cheapens the whole act of eating. It cheapens the act of landscape stewardship. It cheapens the act of farming. It it cheapens the act of communion in its full sense, whether it's biblical sense or, or the communion around the table. To commune with nature, it desecrates that. And so we dare to believe that a culture, a civilization, can only be as moral, as ethical, as righteous, if you will, as its view toward the smallest of these, the weakest of these, the least of these, how we view them creates a moral framework on how we honor and respect the Thomas of Tom, the Mariness of Mary, and a culture that laughs, that scoffs at the idea that we should respect the pigness of the pig will very quickly adopt a manipulative, condescending, mechanistic view towards its citizens and other people in the world. 
And there's such a disconnect, unfortunately, in the food system that, you know, you are so connected with the animals on Polyface Farm. And it's unfortunate that I'd say, I don't know, I don't even know if you have a percentage or a number of how many farms there are, whether in North America or the world, that there is such a disconnect. And why is this happening so much? Uh, why is it happening? <laughs> well, if you want to. If you want to take it on back, we could blame uh, St. Augustine <laughs> I guess, for, for coming up with this uh, kind of notion that there is a segregation between the spiritual and the physical. And we've segregated essentially our lives, our minds into, well, this over here, you know, this is spiritual and this over here is physical and the two never meet. So in the Western world where we have become enamored of things and objects and the how, we don't ask these kinds of spiritually guided or the why questions like they do in the East, and we've allowed ourselves to go down a fairly you know, mechanical path. Now, I am very glad that we have electric lights and we have a four-wheel drive tractor with a front-end loader on it and a chipper and plastic pipe. That all came as a result of our our mechanical creativity and intellectual capacity. But the fact is that we are so smart and clever that we can actually innovate things that we can't spiritually, emotionally, mentally, or physically metabolize. So what happens is, it seems like that, that I mean, read the book Collapse, you know, read Guns, Germs, and Steel. What happens is that we're clever enough to invent things and innovate things that actually destroy us, and then we spend generations trying to remediate the result of our innovation. If we can ever harness all of our innovation in a humble spirit to recognize that there's an order in nature, there are patterns in nature, and keep our cleverness within the context, the framework of those obvious patterns, like animals move, like cows are herbivores, you know, I mean, just really basic stuff, it would keep us from a lot of problems. The fact that we have, you know, bovine spongiform encephalopathy is a direct result of looking at a cow as not an herbivore. The reason that our farm did not adopt feeding dead cows to cows for 30 years, like the U.S., I call it the U.S. duh, was trying to tell us to do and taking us to free steak dinners to teach us this new scientific procedure of feeding dead cows to cows and laughing at us as being Luddites, barbarians, and Neanderthals. Well, you know, anti-science. You don't get on with the, you know, be progressive, you know. And the reason that we didn't buy into it was not because we were anti-science or anti-U.S. duh or anti-progressive. It was because we looked around the world and said, well, show me a place where herbivores eat carrion, and it doesn't exist. And so we didn't do it simply because there was no pattern in nature. Of course, we all know what happened 30, 40 years later. There's this big worldwide mad cow and this, you know, kind of great big uh, collective, oops, maybe we shouldn't ought to have done that, you know. And we now know that, of course, that was a big mistake. But if we had looked at natural pattern to begin with, it would have protected us from all that problem. The point is that just because we can doesn't mean we should. There are plenty of things that we can do that we shouldn't. And there's plenty of opportunity for cleverness in things that we can and should do that they can occupy us for a lifetime. We don't have to be uh, out here doing things that we shouldn't be doing. You mentioned Mad Cow and how cows were being fed to other cows and I hope we've smartened up from that time and now we're not doing that anymore. But what are some of the things that conventional farmers are feeding their animals? Are they sticking with any of the traditional foods that cows, pigs, and chickens should be eating? And how does that differ from what you're feeding your animals? Well, to be sure, cows are still, in the the U.S. at least, cows are still being fed plenty of chicken manure and chicken carcasses and those kinds of things. They're not feeding beef carcasses, but they are feeding chicken manure and chicken carcasses and feathers and things like that, which of course is an extremely unnatural thing. And maybe it just takes more time for it to express itself. Herbivores don't eat any fermented feed in nature uh, because they, they don't dig. Now, pigs and chickens, omnivores, omnivores do dig into the anaerobic layer. And so they do eat fermented anaerobic materials like silage, things like that. So we've got we've got that going on as well. And then of course we've got the whole, you know, ionophores, hormones, antibiotics, antimicrobials, you know, those kinds of things that are being fed routinely. 
And you can read your different studies over the results of all that, all sorts of toxicity, pathogenicity, different things, overriding the immune system. And then, of course, now everything's being fed genetically modified organisms, GMOs. And there is a growing body of evidence now that's connecting the dots on uh, problems with GMOs. I mean, I think it's fascinating that the phrases that we've all begun using, I mean, you know, when I was growing up, I never, never heard the phrase food allergy. Never heard it. And I dare say anybody over 50 probably would agree with me. Never heard, you know, you'd have a a school function or get together, you know, with your friends. Nobody had ever heard of food allergy. Gluten, gluten free, never heard of it. Peanut allergy, never heard of it. I didn't know anybody with autism. I didn't know anybody with type 2 diabetes. Uh, I didn't know anybody with childhood leukemia. The fact that our, that our food is suddenly becoming an enemy should give us all pause to realize that what is supposed to nurture us is starting to kill us off. And, and, and then you, then you have the whole uh, pathogenicity stuff. I mean, I, I never heard, you know, E. coli, salmonella, listeria, campylobacter, not to mention, of course, mad cow. And all of this, from food allergy to campylobacter, all this has come in extremely, extremely recent days with industrial food production. And it's indicative that when nature becomes assaulted in conquistador fashion and disrespected to the degree that we are disrespecting it, nature bats last. Nature has a balance sheet, too. And nature will not be shortchanged. It will not be shortcut forever. Nature bats last. And so this whole lexicon that I've mentioned here, I believe, and there's plenty of science to back it up, I believe that this whole lexicon has been as a result of the aggressive disrespect that we have given toward natural patterns. In the old days, about the greatest thing that happened was just civilizational collapse with soil degradation, soil erosion. That's been going on since the beginning of civilization. In fact, you know, unfortunately, the study of civilization is too often the study of land degradation. So that was the way nature balanced the balance sheets. You know, it had balanced it by, by collapse. You know, the last tree is cut on Easter Island and the population collapsed. And we've seen, you know, plenty of that happening from different great, you know, civilizations that collapsed due to degrading of the soil. But these new things, this campylobacter and all this, that's all new pathogenicity that has occurred as a result of a new set of concentrations in monospeciation and concentrations that were never possible before very, very recent days because you simply couldn't haul enough feedstuff into a place and haul enough manure out to be able to concentrate things to this degree. So you were forced to have multi-speciation, rest periods, and some diversity in your farming practice, you know, the old seven-year rotation, crop rotation, you know, and, and of course, draft power, horses, mules, oxen being herbivores, all required a lot of pasture. Pasture builds soil, tillage reduces soil, and so that created a bit of a break on the kind of concentration and abuse that could be done. At least it was, you know, it was slow. Now, with cheap energy and our, our mechanical uh, savvy, we're able to abuse it much more aggressively. And the U.S. has arguably degraded our soil faster than any other civilization in history due to the mechanical, chemical approach that we've made. And then, to add insult to energy, not only have we degraded our soil, but then we've concentrated our monospeciation in uh, monocrop farms and monospeciated concentrated animal feeding operations and created a whole new set of toxicity and pathogenicity that you know that we didn't have just 50 years ago. It's quite profound. Joel, let's talk about some of the ways that, as an alternative livestock farmer, what are your practices like? How do they differ? How you're feeding your animals? What's a typical day like for you on the farm? Like, are your animals 
out in the sun? Do they have tons of area to roam around? Just give us an idea of what what it looks like over at your farm. Yeah, well, the first thing you would notice is that the animals for most of the year, now, you know, when it gets cold in the winter for about 100 days, for about 100 days, we bring the animals inside. But we don't bring them inside in conventional housing like you would imagine. The chickens are in tall tunnels, you know, plastic hoop structures. So they're very, they're very warm. They're very sunlit, airy, with deep bedding. And the deep bedding is essentially like being on a compost pile. Nature sanitizes two ways, either with rest and sunshine, which is the, the pasture model, the migratory pattern uh, moving model, or with vibrant decomposition, like in a compost pile. Either of those works. And so if we're going to house animals, we put them on deep bedding, like up to 20, 24 inches deep, carbonaceous bedding, like a carbonaceous diaper, and that slowly composts. It grows molds and fungi and roly-polies and worms and things like that, and the animals can stir it, and it, it's like living on a composting bedding, which, of course, is, is very sanitary. So if we're going to bring them in for you know shelter and weather and snow protection, then they're in these very airy facilities, lots of sun, lots of fresh air, and uh, deep bedding, composting bedding. The other 250 days of the year, they're out on pasture. And, of course, every kind of species has its own customized shelter, control, and water. And, you know, if they're going to be out, they, they need to be controlled because, you know, the neighbors don't want them. And we need to be able to, to mimic the kind of migratory pattern that the bison, for example, or the, uh, you know, the, the wildebeest and the Serengeti today exhibit as they move from place to place. So the control is primarily electric fence, and there's electric fence for turkeys, for chickens, for cows, for sheep, ducks, everything. So that they all have this portable, it's a portable control scheme so that we can, you know, move them around. And then portable shelter with bandsaw mills now so that we can essentially make small diameter, small dimensional material like Tinker Toys and make very lightweight portable Tinker Toy type shelters with nursery shade cloth on top. That gives us a, a wonderful, you know, shade protect, like a portable shade tree, if you will. And then the water. So we have, we have six miles of water line on the farm that comes from ponds that we've dug up in the hills on high ground that gravity feeds down. We have about 5 million gallons stored there that we collect winter snow runoff and things and then meter it out during the summer and that waters the animals. We can even use it for irrigation in a dry time, but it all gravity feeds out nice clean water so the animals are fenced out of riparian areas to protect them and the water is delivered via gravity in these gravity-fed pipes so you have portable water systems with little float valves that automatically you know turn off and on as the, as the animals drink. So the cows are moving every day about four o'clock. We move them every day to a new paddock. And the egg mobile, the free range chickens follow the cows about three days. The chickens scratch through the cow patties, eat out the fly larvae, and uh, eat the grasshoppers and crickets that are now exposed and act as a biological sanitizer behind the cow so we don't have to use grubicides, parasiticides, and things like that. The broilers are in little portable, uh, portable fetal shelters, floorless, that we move every day to a fresh spot. We have the Millennium Feather Net, which is surrounded by a portable electric netting, uh, polyethylene with um, space-age stuff, polyethylene webbing with little uh, stainless steel threads woven through it. It'll keep coyotes and bears away and keep the chickens in. I mean, it's cool stuff. 150 feet of it only weighs 12 pounds. One person can take it up and put it down in 10 minutes. You know, this, this is not Grandpa's farm. Grandpa would have given his IT for the kind of stuff uh, that we that we have, and so for the first time in human history, we are able to truly, truly mimic the kinds of migratory patterns that we see expressed in nature that preserves rest and disturbance cycles and the sanitation and hygiene that 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 creates. We can do that on a given piece of land at scale, large scale, small scale, because the equity here. The value here is not in the infrastructure. The value is in the management, the information, and the customer base. And that completely changes the equity structure of the farm.
Yeah, and I referenced the movie earlier to Fresh for our listeners. And if you go and watch that movie, you'll actually see this in action. It's it's quite amazing. So you've created this sustainable oasis, Joel. So do you have neighboring farms around you that, you know, like what are they what are they doing and what do they think? Yeah, well, certainly, you know, we're we're in you know, we're in a very active farming area here. We have you know, we're surrounded by farmers. They pretty much think that we're bioterrorists and typhoid Mary. They're salt of the earth folks. You know, you'd trust all of them with your granddaughter. You just wouldn't trust them with your food. And uh, <laughs> we we live on different planets. They actually do believe. They do believe that our unvaccinated, unmedicated animals are going to get sick because I mean, if you don't medicate them, they get sick, right? So they know that ours are going to get sick, and some red winged blackbird or indigo bunting is going to take our sickness to their livestock, their Tyson chicken house, whatever, and make their animals sick, and they're going to lose their farm, and the world is going to starve to death because a red-winged blackbird took our disease to their Tyson chicken house. They really believe that. And so I don't argue. I don't, uh, you know, I wave, and, and, and I do as much as I can. I mean, we're but they they think we're uh, lunatics, and that's why I wrote the book, The Sheer Ecstasy of Being a Lunatic Farmer, to show the ecstasy that we have, that the things that we don't have to do. I mean, when I see them out there and they're, and they're spraying and they're medicating and all this stuff and losing their soil, and of course all of them are complaining about, you know, there's no money in farming and their kids don't want their farms and they're selling their, I mean, we've got what, six farms for sale within three miles of ours that are all being sold. Nobody's, no, there's no money in farming. There's no joy in farming. It's all sickness and disease and downhill and drugs and pesticides. And it's not a, not a pretty place. So the kids leave and then the parents leave and it goes for sale and nobody buys it. <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that's where we are. But no, we don't, our cheerleaders, our support structure is not our farming neighbors. It's our, urban customers who think we're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Mm -hmm. And you talk about equity and food production. So in terms of just doing a quick comparison of the production of what you are supplying with your farms versus the sustainability of what guy next door is doing. So let's just talk about that because we, you know, you touched lightly about feeding the world and how we can do this sustainably and organically. So how does that fit into that puzzle? Oh, well, we are, we are far more productive and then the neighbors, we're in a, we're in a livestock region here. I mean, there, there is grain, but, um, it's primarily a livestock region. Used to be a lot of dairies and now it's more, uh, beef cattle. So let me, let me just walk you through, for example, but let's take, let's take that as one example. So the average farm in, uh, in Augusta County is on pasture is producing about 2,500 pounds of dry matter per acre per year, okay? And that's under a continuous grazing program where the cows are just out, you know, on a field, they're out there all all the time and they just keep it great. In our system where we confine the cows to a tiny little spot every day and move them every day, we're able to capitalize on the juvenile growth spurt of grass. Grass grows in a S curve, if you can imagine an S here. The bottom of the S would be what I call um, diaper grass. The middle of the S, where it really shoots up, I'll call that teenage grass. And out the top, I'll call that, that senescent period, I'll call that nursing home grass, okay? So you got three stages of grass growth. So if we don't allow the herbivore pruning to occur. And see, and see, nature does this automatically with, you know, migratory patterns, wolves, fire, and, and, and all that. But when we, you know, when we fence fields, then obviously we break up all that migratory, that, that instinctual behavior. So we've got to compensate with something and we compensate with it with our own control. If we don't allow those cows to come into that grass until it's come out that top of the S, through the teenage growth spurt, then we capture all of that rapid growth period of time in the physiology of the plant. The result is that where the average grass plant in our county gets grazed 20 times in a season at one inch tall, we graze it only maybe three times a year, but it's 18 inches tall. And the difference is that in our county, 
where the average farmer, the average in our county, is 2,500 pounds of dry matter per acre, we're generating 10,000 pounds of dry matter per acre, and that's without planting a seed or buying an ounce of fertilizer in 55 years. So just imagine, I mean, so we're, you know, we're running roughly five times the county average. Just imagine, or four times at least, just imagine if all the neighbors did that. And then imagine if the whole county did that. Imagine if the whole state did that. The truth is that our weak link is not about resources, air, soil, water, money, manpower, nothing. Our weak link is management. We don't manage like nature manages. It should give us all pause to realize that 500 years ago, what is today the United States, grew more food 500 years ago than it does today, even with tillage, John Deere, chemicals, GMOs, and and everything else. So, you know, nature has a lot to teach us. And if we apply then humbly our cleverness and mechanical savvy to it as a caress rather than a conquistador, nature's not a reluctant partner that we have to, you know, coerce and force and make, and I'm going to make you do, you know, produce this. Nature's actually a benevolent lover, but it responds like a lover to an informed caress rather than a conquistador mentality. Joel, let's talk about quality of food here. Your animals are eating their natural diets or as close to it as you can provide. How, let's start with a cow. How would, say, beef differ from grass-fed cows compared to cows that are part of a factory farm? Well, one of the biggest differences is simply in the fat profile, the kind of fat. Our fat tends to have a little bit of color to it, not just white, white, and it's more polyunsaturated as opposed to paraffin-like. And then you have your individual vitamins and minerals. And one of the best places that kind of keeps up on this is the website eatwild.com, maintained by Joe Robinson, who wrote the book Pasture Perfect, and I think uh, Grass Fed is Best or something like that. She's written numerous ones, and I think she wrote The Omega Diet. But anyway, the idea, th- this is a website that keeps up with the latest, you know, latest, greatest findings on the differences, and they are profound. Uh, you know, take riboflavin. Riboflavin is, uh, is it a nutrient that, that calms our nerves. It's, uh, real important for nerve health. And, you know, grass finished beef has 300% more riboflavin than conventional beef. Conjugate linoleic acid, you know, there's a big one. Uh, it's an anti-carcinogen. For many, many years, uh, researchers wondered, well, how, you know, if, if, if beef causes colon cancer, which is, you know, kind of that's the, that's the, that's the assumption. Why is it that in Argentina, where the per capita consumption, are you ready for this? The per capita consumption of beef in Argentina is half a pound per person per day. Can you imagine? Half a pound of beef per person per day. And their colon cancer rate is half what it is in the U.S. And this puzzled researchers all the time until actually not very long ago, just in the last couple of decades, they found this huge difference between grain-finished animals, uh, beef, and grass-finished in the conjugated linoleic acid. CLA is known as, for short, CLA is one of the number one uh, anti-carcinogenic compounds in the universe. And it only takes 14 days of grain feeding a beef animal to pretty much chase all the CLA out of the body. It's also uh, prevalent in dairy animals that are grass pasture dairy animals too, butter and milk and all that. So there are really, really profound differences. I mean, eggs, you know, Mother Earth News magazine commissioned a study about four years ago where they worked with 12 of us around the country and we sent our eggs to a lab in, I think it was Oregon or Washington, and compared them to the USDA label. And, you know, I'll, I'll just pick out one. Folic acid, which of course is real important for pregnant women, the USDA standard nutrient analysis on eggs is like 48 micrograms per egg of folic acid. <laughs> our egg, our eggs was 1,038 micrograms of folic acid. I mean, when you when you look at these numbers, they're not just you know two percent deviations. It's not just a little bit. Most of them are are by fat, you know multiple 
duplicative factors of two and three and four, just a, a massive differences. Omega three, omega six ratios, very very different. So this is not this is not the same thing. It's a farm spelled P H A R M. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And not to mention a lot of the hormones, the growth hormones and the antibiotics that you're going to find in a lot of the factory farm meats, the stuff you're producing is going to be void of all of that too. Yeah, and, and let me just say one other thing about that because it, it is sometimes hard to get GMO-free grains. It's, it's Sometimes it's hard to be you know pure. We've, as you can imagine, uh, we've been in this long time and we've uh, encountered lots of fringe kind of people. So we've had every kind of food allergy and, you know, reaction to things. Uh, we've had people check us empirically, check us with uh, pendulums, crystals, you know, the biodynamic uh, chromatography, the uh, Sears, whatever, the Sirius machines. Uh, you know, where you hold the probes. I mean, we've been, our stuff's been checked over and over and over again. And we believe that, and we've always, you know, come out great. And we believe that the reason is because our animals get so much chlorophyll. That's in the green grass. Chlorophyll is nature's number one detoxicant. So if these animals are getting a lot of grass in their diet, fresh, fresh grass, it will cover a multitude of sins. And when that grass is, when they're not getting that, and they're not getting fresh green, everything builds up and goes to pot. So I just can't say enough about the fresh green grass. And and that's one of the things that disturbs me the most when I go visit farms that say, well, you know, we're doing your methods. And I go, and, and the pigs are on dirt. The chickens are on dirt. And that's not a, that's not a recipe for success. You know, you're going to have disease and sickness and you're not going to have the differences that come when they're put on that fresh salad bar every day to get all the greens they can possibly get. So, Joel, we have happier farmers, I'm sure, working on farms such as yours, happier, healthier animals. Why aren't more farmers embracing the type of farming practices you're all about and you're doing on Polyface? Well, you have to realize that if our kind of farming became uh, the new norm, it would completely invert the power, position, prestige, and profits of the entire uh, world food system. That's a big ship to turn around. And, of course, it's been a long time in developing. And, and in all fairness, I think it's important to note that from 1870 to 1930, that was a period of escalating industrial farming on farms prior to much of the infrastructure and technology that we currently have. And so when the industry looks at me and says, oh, you want us to go back to, you know, hog cholera, tuberculosis, and Merrick's disease in chickens and Newcastle's and, you know, all these diseases. The reason that there was such a plethora of those diseases during that 50, 60 year period was because it was the industrialization of the country, the urbanization of the country. People were leaving farms, going to the cities. And farms were expanding multiplicatively in size and volume. So the orchard lot that used to have five sows was suddenly holding 30 sows. And without electric fencing, plastic water pipes so you could find and control water, wood chippers so you could give deep bedding, composting, manure spreaders so you could you know, easily spread material, front-end loaders, augers, electrification, all of these new modern infrastructures that we have now, without those, these early industrializing farms were extremely pathogenic, unsanitary, unhygienic for the stock. And so it took a while for all this other infrastructure to develop. Well, by that time, let's say the early 1960s or late 1950s, by that time, we already had a tremendous amount of inertia, you know, distribution, intellectual equity, you know, land-grant universities. I mean, the, the whole support structure, the commerce, the scientific community, everything was, you know, out with that whole outdoor, outside stuff, you know. Man, it just about killed us. Now with antibiotics and concrete and infrastructure, you know, we, we can do this. So that went real well for a while until now. It's absolutely crumbling, and all of these new diseases and the new, new lexicon of of uh, pathogenicity 
is a whole new generation that manifests that this cycle has also run its gamut. So what we need to do is go back, is appreciate the, you know, the pigness of the pig, but fully embrace the high tech. And I think generally farmers like me are branded as Luddites, barbarians, Neanderthals who don't want to make any progress. But I can assure you here on our farm, we have tons of space age infrastructure that allows us to do outdoor systems and do them much more sanitary and hygienically than you could in a, you know, in a confinement animal feeding operation. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I just want to briefly touch upon food security and access to good food because there's so many people who resist or complain that they can't afford good food. So how do we work around that and how can we get people to connect to eating healthier, more sustainable food? Well, I've got kind of three things. Uh, so the first one is to get in your kitchen. People don't realize often that food price is directly related to food process. Interesting story, I was up in the green markets of New York City a couple of years ago that arguably, you know, the Union Square Farmer's Market Green Market there in New York City is arguably the most expensive market in the entire world. So I asked my guide, I, my hostess, I said, could you take me to the most expensive potato in this market? She said, oh, I, I know the, I know the guy. So we headed off out through the crowd there and found this uh, potato vendor. He had a credenza of about 20 different varieties of potatoes. There were, you know, yellow ones and red ones and and blue ones and green ones and white ones and and oblong and round and and all this. So I looked at all the little cubicles to find the most expensive one, and it was a little heirloom blue Peruvian fingerling potato. It was $1.99 a pound. Now, that's expensive for a potato. But all around that green market were grocery stores with you know, a hundred linear feet of fluorescent lighted retail space, shelving, air conditioning, and heating for potato chips of uh, $2.99 and, you know, $3.50 a pound, way almost double the price of the most expensive blue Peruvian heirloom potato in the world. The point I'm making is if you want to reduce your food budget, get raw material, get bulk material, raw material, unprocessed material. We've never had our kitchens more techno-gadgetized than we do today, but spent less time in them and been more ignorant as to how to use these things. We have time baked. We, you know, we don't have to go draw water from the well anymore. We don't have to start a wood cook stove three hours before we want to cook. We've got indoor plumbing. We've got hot water on demand. You've got, you know, a stove that you can flick a button and get heat. I mean, never have we been blessed with such culinary technological helpers and used it so little. So get in your kitchen. That's number one. And do your own processing, packaging, and that sort of thing. Buy in bulk. You know, buy bushels of tomatoes, can them, dehydrate them, fruit leather them, whatever you're going to do. Make your own salsa. Go do it. That's number one. Number two is buy directly from farmers. Don't go to the supermarket. Don't go to the grocery store. They've only been here since 1946. We don't really need them except for maybe toilet paper and Kleenex. Cut off the TV, forget the movies for a month, and go find your food treasures. Every community is surrounded by wonderful, wonderful integrity food producers. Find them. Patronize them. Many of them are literally 10 customers away from being able to farm full-time. You be the one that enables them to do their dream full time. And then the third thing I would say is do something yourself, whether it's a vermicomposting bin under your kitchen sink or whether it's, you know, throw out the gerbil, the dog, the cat, the cobra, and get uh, two chickens for your condo to eat your kitchen scraps and give you eggs, a beehive on the roof, a pot garden on the, um, you know, a container garden. Pot garden has, you know, other ramifications. But, you know, in pots, there are so many cool urban stackable you know, things that you can do something to participate in the majesty, the mystery, and the awesomeness of creative force. I wish I could snap my fingers and nobody would have to change anything and we would suddenly have really healthy food and everybody would be healthy. <laughs> but nothing works that way. It's going to take individual participation and understanding to change things. And that means that means you got to get off the bleachers and get in the ball, get in the game, and that'll be different things to different people. But uh, getting in the game is going to be is going to be necessary to changing the game. 
I love that. Those are great tips. And yeah, you know, empowering people to take responsibility. So Joel, just before we wrap up here, we like to do something with all of our guests. And this is a rapid fire question round where we just ask you some questions and you just answer the first thing that comes to mind. Sound good? (laughs) Okay. All right. So what are two things you do in the morning to get your day started? Well, I have devotions. I pray a little bit and read the Bible a little bit. Then I go out and I kind of take a quick survey around the farm just to listen, look, smell. Is anything out of order? You know, just to kind of get, you know, grounded for the day. Nice. And what makes you feel most alive? When I go and sit in the pasture with the cows and they start licking my ears and shoes. Aw, I love that. (laughs) So this might be a funny one, but what animal best describes you? Probably a chicken. I'm fearless, but sometimes fearless beyond the point of uh, reason. (laughs) (laughs) So, Joel, what is one thing most people don't know about you? Probably that that I really, really like citrus. And it's a bummer because I don't live in Centrus country, but I, my first four years of life were in Venezuela, South America in the tropics, and we had banana trees and pineapples and all that stuff. They say that as a tiny child, a lot of your, your tastes and things like that are set. That's the one thing where I'm, I'm a big local food advocate, uh, but man, I'll tell you what, do I like my bananas. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That's a good one. So, Joel, after this interview, Where would you like people to go and uh, connect with you, see some of the information you're putting out to the world? Where would you recommend? Well, our website, polyfacefarms.com, all one word, uh, P-O-L-Y-F-A-C-E-F-A-R-M-S, polyfacefarms.com. It's a wonderful website. We have a lot of information. We link to press information. There are value statements. There's the Hen House blog my speaking schedule. If you want to go hear me talk, my speaking schedule's on there. If you're in the area and you want to go to a restaurant that serves our stuff that's on there, uh, it's a it's a pretty pretty broad uh, website and with a lot of information. Great. With all the documentaries and books that you've been featured in as well, correct? Yes. yes Amazing. Yes. And we do, we do have a gift shop, you know, where my books are available. Of course, they're all available on Amazon.com, but we make more money if you buy them from us. Of course. Uh, you know, and, and t-shirts with things like everything I want to do is illegal and, you know, grass fed and all sorts of cool stuff. I love it. Is there one thing you can leave our listeners with at the end of this interview? Just, you know, one action step they can do to do better? Yeah, the one thing that I like to tell people is, as adults, we have this memory of some matriarch or patriarch looking over our shoulder, remonstrating us with, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. And as we grow, we become more intimidated sometimes by this voice, you know, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. And and we actually become timid about trying new things. And so what I want to tell people is that Grandma or grandpa or whoever it was, it's in your memory, gruffly speaking over your shoulder, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. They were wrong, actually. The truth is, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly first. Because we don't do anything well first. We don't do anything right first. We don't write well. We don't talk well. We don't walk well. We don't poop well. I guess we do poop well. We don't don't know where to put it. But the point is that we don't do anything well first. And so... You know, when some of these things, I mean, some people are intimidated by, by, by cooking, you know, or, or uh, getting a, getting a unprocessed food. How do I thaw a chicken? I mean, we, we work with this every day. And so the thing is, don't let it stymie you and don't worry about doing it poorly. Just start and skill comes as you start. And pretty soon it'll be old hat. You'll know where to find your food. You'll know how to make a meal from scratch and you'll be the happiest, healthiest person out there. I love that, Joel. So go out there. Just do it. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. And what a great place to end things. So we want to thank you so much for coming on the show, Joel. We had so much we could have got into. Hopefully, you'll come back on in the future and we can uh, dig even deeper into this stuff because you have some amazing information that's really unique and people need to get your message and the word needs to get out there. So thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for having me, and I look forward to the next time. Yes, thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you.
Listeners are one call to action for you if you haven't done so already. Please head over to iTunes and leave us a rating and review. And we just thank you guys for listening. We'll uh, talk to you guys soon. Take care. <laughs>